When you think about good Fire Emblem units, you see a lot of common traits between them. Good units tend to have good offensive stats and at least decent bulk, good units tend to have good move, and even better if they have a horse or a pair of wings, and good units tend to have access to good 1-2 ranged combat. Not every great unit has all of these features, and there are a bunch of other random features that can help make a unit good, like great promotion bonuses, solid bases, or access to staves, but most good units sport at least some of these qualities. We can see that when we look at some of the common picks for the best units in Fire Emblem games. Seth has awesome 1-2 range on a horse, Camilla has great combat on a wyvern, Ryoma has awesome 1-2 combat in a game with a lot of tools to move him around. But in the original Fire Emblem, the best unit is Marth, a footlocked, sword-locked lord that can never promote. Just looking at his surface level qualities, this makes him seem pretty bad. Despite this, Marth is not only the best unit in Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, he's one of the best units in the entire series. So let's take a look at why Marth is such a strong unit despite looking very comparable to weaker lords like Elwood, Erika, and Roy on a surface level. But first, a big thank you to my geckos on Patreon, and a shout out to my skinks, Red Mage Morgan, Chicken, Morg Wolf, Upscale Furry Trash, Cosplay Sylveon, Emma, Van West, Ike Poo, Lucy Sev, Romeo, and Aaron Kedden. I really appreciate all of your support. If you want to support the channel and appear in videos like this, you'll find a link to the Patreon in the video description. In a lot of Fire Emblem games, some of the features of Marth that I just mentioned would be major impediments, but fortunately, he's an FE1, which is a game designed in a way that is very kind to him. To start with, Fire Emblem 1 is not a game that is loaded with two range enemies. For the first several maps, Marth is likely to encounter two or maybe three two range enemies on his way to the throne. So the lack of two range for him isn't the end of the world. Even in the later game, one range enemies are the more common variety by far. And swords are actually pretty good in this game. They're more accurate than lances and axes, and they're considerably lighter. An iron sword is four weight less than an iron lance, so swords are doubling more and they're hitting more. And even better is that Marth starts with a rapier, which he has exclusive access to. It deals effective damage against cavaliers and armors, of which there are many. And unlike most Fire Emblem games, you can buy more rapiers at several shops, so he'll have access to rapiers for the bulk of the playthrough. There are some other special swords available towards the end of the game for Marth, but we'll get into those later. The point here is, being one range and sword locked isn't the end of the world in this game, it often barely matters at all. Especially since the Silver Lance and Silver Sword have the same might in this game, and once you get later in the game, you're really mostly going to be using silvers and special weapons anyway, so there's not even really a might advantage to using lances. And then axes are just really heavy and sad in this game, so swords are often the best weapon type to have in Fire Emblem 1. So sword lock isn't a big impediment here. One of the things I like to look at when evaluating a unit is how they can contribute to us reliably or quickly clearing maps, or both. Normally, the quickly part is an issue for footlocked units like Marth as they have lower move than mounted units. That means on something like a kill boss or route map, a mounted unit can literally get the map done faster than a footlocked unit because they can get to the boss faster or they can get to enemies faster. And even if you don't care about speed for speed's sake, finishing maps quicker often results in avoiding annoying reinforcements, and moving quickly also allows us to get to side objectives like villages before they're destroyed. Basically, having high move in a Fire Emblem game just means you're more likely to be on time to objectives. And this is something that can make a footlocked unit unappealing compared to a mounted unit if the mounted unit has similar stats. But the way that FE1 is set up largely lets Marth get away with being footlocked, and the big reason for this is that every FE1 map is a seize map, meaning that they end when Marth gets to the end of the map. In practice, this means that we are always playing the game at Marth's pace. Even if your cavaliers could kill every enemy on the map two turns before Marth gets to the throne, the map isn't ending until Marth gets there. Similarly, villages have to be visited by Marth. So despite being footlocked, Marth is always on time to objectives because Marth sets the pace. This is in contrast to the way that some lords in other games can be left behind when objectives are route or kill boss. So even though he has two less move than the Christmas calves, Marth doesn't have an issue getting to objectives on time because he defines what on time means. Now, in a lot of other games, a footlocked lord and a lot of seize objectives just means that the lord spends a lot of time being rescued instead of doing combat, but Marth doesn't suffer this indignity because there is no rescue in FE1. Marth is walking or warping to every objective. So much like Swordlock doesn't stop Marth from contributing, Footlock doesn't either. Marth always has to walk to the objective. Now, you may be saying, Lizard, these are reasons why Marth isn't bad. But why is he good? He just sounds like a regular unit with pretty decent stats. 
But some of these factors I'm discussing, such as Marth needing to be present for objectives, should start to show how FE1 warps itself around Marth. And the game warping around Marth is a very good thing for him. Being the most important unit in the game has certain benefits and encourages investment that will pay off for us sooner rather than later. One way that the game warps itself around Marth in a way that makes him really powerful is the way that the AI works. In Fire Emblem 1, enemies absolutely love attacking Marth. He's like a magnet for red units. Even when better attacks are available, they want to hit Marth. This makes Marth play differently than most lords in the series. First, it means that we can use him to manipulate the AI. If you want an enemy to move in a specific way, or if you want to draw their attention away from another unit, all you have to do is move Marth to the place you want the enemy to go, or make sure he's in range of the enemies that you don't want to hit your other unit. Second, and very importantly, the AI being obsessed with Marth means Marth gets to do a whole lot of combat. Enemies will happily throw themselves at Marth, and his combat situation is fine in the early game and actively good later. So unless you hide Marth or block enemies from getting to him, he's gonna get to do a lot of combat and gain a lot of experience. This snowballs into Marth's combat getting even better from his solid growths to the point where he can eventually just juggernaut entire chapters. Maps worth of enemies are happy to throw themselves at Marth just to get one rounded. Even on warp skip maps where you aren't playing on enemy phase, you are still rewarded for good Marth combat. Because if you aren't trying to one turn the map, Marth saves you a warp if he's the unit you warp to kill the boss, instead of using a different unit and then warping Marth into C's. His stats are good enough for this. Here's how he compares at base to the game's two Christmas calves, who are pretty good combat units. And here's a growth comparison. Not bad at all. Marth will end up with pretty good stats at the end of the game, and he's serviceable from map 1. Being an enemy magnet and the pace setter for each map also makes Marth a great candidate for stat boosters, which are insane in Fire Emblem 1. The power ring gives 4 strength, speed rings give 6 speed, and boots give a tremendous 4 move. And Marth is the best candidate for using these boosters to fix any deficiencies he may have if you get unlucky level ups, or when you just want to top off his strength towards the end of the game. Of course, these stat boosters could go to other units, but they won't reward you for your investment like Marth does. Marth has to be at more objectives than any other unit, and enemies love to attack him, so he usually does a lot of combat. Boosting up your Marth ensures that when those red units magnetically attract themselves to him, that he takes them out in a single turn. So between stat boosters and the way EXP naturally funnels into Marth, it's not long before he's juggernauting maps, and once he snags the boots in Chapter 12, he's also zooming around for the rest of the run. Now, you might think it's unfair to assume Marth gets all these stat boosters, but he really is the best candidate for them, especially the boots, because remember, Marth has to be at every objective, so how fast you can finish maps and get villages is entirely determined by how long it takes Marth to get there. So more move on Marth means it's easier to get to villages before they're destroyed, and that you'll finish maps more often before the annoying ambush reinforcements spawn and maybe jump scare one of your units. When Marth has to be everywhere and everyone wants to attack Marth, making him able to one round is just better than making someone else able to one round. And he doesn't need a ton of help because his stats are actually pretty good. A strength ring gets him close to the cap by the end of the game, and Marth's speed on average is good enough to double all the important enemies, especially when you consider that he uses swords, the lightest weapon type in the game. So even though he doesn't promote, Marth can get the stats that he needs to to dominate the game because of three factors. Stat caps are only 20, stat boosters give a tremendous amount of stats, and enemy quality in FE1 isn't that high. Wyverns in Chapter 22, for example, have just 9 or 10 speed before we even factor in weapon weight, so it takes less than 11 speed to double the scariest enemies on this late game map. There's one more reason you have a vested interest in training Marth, and that is that he is the best candidate for killing the final boss. Medius has very high bulk with a whopping 35 defense and negates ranged attacks. So the mere mortals on our team can only hurt him with the Gradivus or a Devil Sword. And even then, a capped strength unit with the Gradivus is only doing a sad 5 damage to our final boss, who's sitting at a comfortable 45 HP. Fortunately for us, Marth is just built different and has access to the Falchion, which only sports 10 might but is effective against Medius, meaning a capped strength Marth is dealing a cool 15 damage per hit to everyone's favorite evil dragon. When you're not fighting Medius, the Falchion has the ridiculous quality of negating non manakeet attacks, so some enemies literally can't touch Marth while he's one-rounding them in return. But admittedly, this is a little less exciting than it sounds, because the last couple chapters just have a lot of manakeets, and there's a good chance you're warp-skipping them anyway. 
Mirth also gets access to the Mercurius Sword, which doubles his growth rates, and that's great if you've managed not to cap his level by chapter 18, but there's a good chance you already have. Even so, it's still an 18 might sword that only Marth can use, so not bad at all, especially if you didn't give him one of the two power rings. There's one other thing I want to talk about that Marth does, but I'm tacking it on the end here because some people don't like to give him credit for this, but I do. Villages are another way that Marth is emphasized in Fire Emblem 1. Like I said earlier, he's the only one that can visit them. Now, some people prefer not to give Marth credit for the items that he gets from villages, but I disagree with this. Marth visiting villages he has exclusive access to is really no different than something like FE7 Matthew grabbing early chests and stealables that only he has access to. As long as we're giving early thieves credit for exclusive thief utility, I think Marth should get credit for village utility. So throughout the game, Marth gets us a bunch of gold plus some useful items like the Hamern staff. But even if you don't want to give him credit for this, he's still the best unit in the game. Everything in Fire Emblem 1 is telling us to invest in Marth, and if we do, we are very rewarded for it. From an ease of use perspective, Marth makes FE1 one of the easiest games to complete. Once he gets a few levels, which he easily can since his early game performance is as good as all your other non-Jagan units, a successful approach to every map becomes Marth walks towards the objective, everyone else just chills. I mean, just look at this. You warp him into a group of enemies and he can take care of them no problem. It's ridiculous. And yeah, you can do this with other units, but if we neglect Marth in favor of investing in others, we're only making the game harder on ourselves. Marth has to be at every objective, he's by far the best choice to fight the final boss, and enemies want to attack him anyway, so unless you're actively hiding him, he's going to get the experience he needs easily. And then he also has access to unique tools like the Rapier, Falchion, and Mercurius. Marth is a fascinating unit because although his stats are good, the things that make him the strongest unit in the game and worth investing in are more things that are harder to see on paper. Being forced to play at Marth's pace, a lack of rescue meaning that he doesn't end up in a horse's pocket, low stat caps, weak enemies, an AI that loves to attack Marth, a final boss that Marth excels against and other units struggle with, and powerful stat boosters are mostly factors you won't see by looking at Marth's stats and growths. But it's these factors that make him one of the best lords in the series, rather than the liability that a lot of people perceive other sword-locked, foot-locked lords to be. So that's why Marth is Fire Emblem's weirdest best unit to me. In other games, the best unit's utility is usually very obvious. They either have way better combat than other units, or have access to powerful staves. But Marth's utility is unique, and it's difficult to get a sense for it by just looking at his stats. And I think that's pretty cool. But what do you think? Are there any other units that on the surface don't seem that exciting, but have circumstances that make them good or great? I'd love to hear about them in the comments, and if you liked the video, be sure to hit the like and subscribe button so you never miss an upload, and if you want to talk about Fire Emblem more, consider joining the community discord linked in the video description. Either way, thanks for hanging out, and have yourself a lovely week.